Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Toastmasters, I want to introduce today Jerry Evans. Before I do that, I want to make sure that nobody has any noisemakers that they need to turn off or adjust. To make sure you're in the right place, you are in the successful open house meeting today. Everybody's here to see if they can make that successful open house work for them in their club. Jerry Evans is an amazing Toastmaster. He started here five years ago in July, so he's about to have his fifth anniversary. He's done so many things. He's a DTM. He's been Toastmaster of the Year. He's been astounding for our district and for his clubs. Jerry Evans, thank you. Thank you. You know, it's been interesting, this journey that we take in Toastmasters, and we each have different reasons for why we join Toastmasters. And I have the opportunity, so I'm the current District 30 Club Extension Chair, so I have the opportunity to go around and start a new Toastmasters Club, which is a passion of mine, because the district cannot survive if we just stay static and never open new clubs, because there's always an attrition in every club, it doesn't matter which club you belong to, whether it's corporate club and or community club. For those of you who attended Lance's session, he was talking about the statistics. Totally, Toastmasters loses 33% of their clubs, which means we lose 33% of our members. In District 30, that's perfect, thank you, Ivan. In District 30, some clubs lose 40 to 50% of their membership. And then you've got the attrition, of course, of clubs. This year alone, we've had 20, I think we're, we've lost 22 or 23 clubs. And you think about when all of you joined Toastmasters, probably some of the people you initially joined with, we'll go around and kind of take a quick survey in a moment, you probably aren't seeing some of those same people when you started. <clears throat> the person sitting next to you across the room or down the table, some of those people, they don't come to, they don't attend the meetings anymore. I call them Toastmaster drop-ons. Sometimes they're kind of like casual Toastmasters. They drop in once in a while. You know, they're kind of like they make a cameo appearance, as, as Lance was talking about it. So really, what we're talking about today, when we talk about a successful club, or successful open house for our clubs, we're really talking about a couple things. It's about engagement, because sometimes we talk about a Toastmasters retention. Well, engagement drives retention. But you first have to start with what? Attraction. We have to attract members. And Lance was talking about in his session, it would be great if all you do is you, you know, you, each one of you have your club websites up, and you just depend on that club website to drive membership to your club. How does that work? Does Not it work very well? No. Yeah, partially. To, 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 to some extent. So, but what happens though once we get them in the club? Because your vice president membership, Lance was talking about this, your vice president membership and your vice president of PR have to work jointly and in tandem with one another because one plays off the other. And we were talking about conducting a successful open house. And I'm going to call upon all of you because we want this to be interactive. We're a small group, so there's no need, I think, to you know, to, to do it formally. Let's do this informally so that we can kind of learn from one another because some of you perhaps who have been at Toastmasters for a while and you've been to open houses, you've conducted an open house of your own, and we're going to share some ideas with one another so that we can all learn from one another and perhaps go, well, you know, we did this in our club for an open house, but maybe Stan did it differently in their club, so how can we collaborate? Because no one of us has the answer. I don't have all the answers for you in terms of how to really run a successful open house because there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. And what works for one club may not necessarily work for another club. There's a long checklist of different things which we'll review, but it really starts pretty basic. Let's quickly go around the room. Just tell me what club you're with. Give me your name and what club you're with, and then we'll, we'll go from there. You can start with... My name is Lily Simmons. I'm with uh, Park Forest Toastmasters and also EPA Toastmasters. Okay. Sam? Stan Roker, Daniel Wright Toastmasters. Okay. Angela Underwood, Bellwood Toastmasters. 
Patty Luxinger, Crystal Clear Toastmasters. Robert Ballard, Christ Universal Temple, Toastmasters Club number two. Charles Watson, Chicago South. Paul Racino, Fox Valley Toastmasters. Emily Sigami, Extreme Windy City and View Masters. She's, she's a slow learner. She keeps joining all these clubs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stephen Liu, Daniel Wright Toastmasters. Okay. Okay, right. Sharon. Sharon Cruz, Daniel Wright Toastmasters. Manish Maheshwari, Liberty Motor Toastmasters. Liberty Motor. And Laurie. Laurie Harrington, Tom Friars, Toastmaster, Talk of Lincolnshire, Toastmasters, and Speaking of Success. Which is an advanced club. <laughs> Toby, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, Toby Baker, North Shore Badgers. Is in the heart of downtown Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Toby was, Toby was gracious enough. For those of you that looked at the agenda, you notice I'm not Ethel Goatee. You're not? <laughs> <laughs> I'm taller than Ethel. <laughs> Thank you. Just a, just a little bit. But we finally refer to Ethel as Mighty E because she really is a powerhouse. And because of some family obligations today, she couldn't be here, so they'd ask me to come in and they sort of volunteered me to do this session today. I know a lot of you are familiar with that term. If you aren't, you'll learn it in Toastmasters. <laughs> exactly. You'll get volunteered many times when the opportunity comes to, to take on different roles. Let me quickly give you uh, my background now that you've shared uh, your club and, and where you're from. Uh, I started in Toastmasters, as Lori said, five years ago. I stepped in my first Toastmasters meeting in July of 2008. And actually, I joined Toastmasters with my son, Kevin. He said, Dad, there's this cool thing we really can do together. It's called Toastmasters. Are you up for it? I said, sure, why not? So he and I walked into Mount Prospect Toastmasters July 8th, 2008. Now fast forward, it's now five years later. And if you would have asked me what I've done, all these different things, as Lori was talking about over the past five years, I would have told you, are you kidding me? let alone getting involved in helping to start new Toastmaster clubs. And what I've learned with that experience, I've done that over the past two years, is some lessons in terms of how to open up a club, number one. Number two, really to get people more engaged in those clubs. Because I use an acronym called IASK when I was doing the Vice President Membership. And it's a real simple acronym to, to remember if you want to write this down. And it simply states IASF. I-A-S-K, and it stands for Invite, Ask, Sign, and Keep. Because we have to invite someone, first of all, in some form or another, they find Toastmasters. And then when they visit the club as a guest or a visiting Toastmaster, we have to ask them, and I've seen people in clubs do this really terrific, and then others who do it really poorly, Oh, Sharon, you wouldn't want to join Toastmasters, would you? <laughs> it's kind of taking a negative approach to it. Or sometimes they, they really do it so badly because they put the person on the spot and the person feels uncomfortable to begin with, right? We've seen this happen. And the person's standing there. And all you want to just, you know, what did you think of the meeting? Well, do you want to join today? And they're really right in their face. They're kind of pushing it. And we always never want to do that in Toastmasters where we're pushing because then people have a tendency to resist. Because our job is not to sell them on Toastmasters. Lance was saying in his session, it's really to create a dynamic meeting environment. So when we put on a dynamic meeting, Stan goes, I'm in. I want to join this club. The third thing that I've learned is that in open houses in particular, that's when you really have to step up your game. Because we as Toastmasters, it's always we're already wanting to step outside that comfort zone. Because we know that's really where our learning comes from the most. It's when we step outside that comfort zone, we push kind of those boundaries. And each time we step outside our comfort zone, we grow our self-confidence. And then the members, they kind of, you know, see that. So when we're conducting an open house, the first thing you have to do, without a doubt, is, you know, Joan says it when we go to the deck meetings all the time, is you have to set your goal, you have to plan your work in a sense, and you have to work your plan. And that applies to doing an open house. Because first you have to think about, okay, if we want to do an open house, when do we want to do an open house? 
we don't wake up today and stand, well, let's, Jared, let's do an open house tomorrow. <laughs> or let's just do it next week and we'll hope people will come, right? We'll build it, they'll come. It doesn't work that way. Minimally, I would suggest to you, and I'll, I'll pass this around in a moment, in terms of lead time, I would encourage you to consider at least five weeks in advance, minimum. At least five weeks in advance. I'm going to kind of give you a timeline of why I say that. Yes, Mr. I never been to open house. No, not exactly. Okay. What is it? Can you? I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll get into detail in a moment. Okay. So you have the opportunity to showcase your club. But first, you want to think. Okay, when do we want to do it? We want to set the date out into the future. You want to get it on your club calendar and your club website. You want to put that date out there. So, like, okay, we're going to do it July, let's say you're going to do it July the 23rd, whatever the date is. You get that on your calendar. This way, first of all, you can communicate that to all your internal membership. Because if members, I mean, depending on whether or not they read the Vice President of Education's email or VPM, whoever's disseminating any information, we would like to think that Toastmasters always read the emails <laughs> that go out from club officers, but that's not really what happens. Some do, some don't. So to give them the benefit of the doubt, you want to make sure that you clearly communicate your date. Then, who's an officer in their club right now? Okay, Sharon, what's your role right now? Currently VPE. VPE. VP of uh, Public Race. PR, okay. And lawyer, what are you writing? VPE. Okay. So VPE, VP of PR. You know how I said them working in tandem in particular? So now you want to form a committee because not one person can drive a successful open house. If you think you can, as, as Lance said, God bless. So you want to form a committee, a team. LaShonda Milton, who some of you probably don't know who she is, she's one of our area governors, and she's the one who I brought this clapper. She's the most energetic, enthusiastic, excited area governor you want to meet, because every, every meeting, deck meeting we go to, she's up there <laughs> just doing this clapper. She has an opportunity to, to, to go with me sometimes when we do the sample meetings, but just her energy and her enthusiasm. So when you put together your committee, think about who in your club, as far as the committee, is really going to help you drive it. So if it's your VPE and your VPR, you want to get them working together. And really, in my opinion, it's a collaborative effort amongst everyone in the club, especially your officers. But you want to get everybody involved and you want the buy-in. Then something for you to consider is, okay, we picked out a date, we're forming our committee, and your committee, and I know Lori's done open house before. Lori, how many committees when you did your last open house? How many did you have? Five. Okay. And can you let everybody know what some of those were? Just some of them, remember? The first one was to decide when, then we had to get our own committees or people that would aid us from the club. Then each, each one of them reported to the president, or each, each main member reported to the president what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. Then we followed up with reporting and using email and telephone when we weren't meeting physically together. So you have folks that, first of all, are going to make a commitment to taking on whatever those roles are because you're going to have someone who's going to be your main driver, so if it's VP, PR. But you're also going to have someone who's going to take care of the food, someone that's going to take care of the refreshments. Your VP of PR, when we talk about, I'm just going to pass these around. You're going to have someone that you want to, you know, Blanche talked about this in the session. Something happens when you don't promote your open house, or for that matter, if something happens when you don't promote your club. Nobody nothing. <laughs> but nobody knows about yeah. you're having an open house. Yeah. And again, you don't get it on your calendar your club calendar, and then now the district will actually allow us to post it on the district calendar, on an open house, and when you're sending out a flyer, and it has to be uh, TI compliant, I have to say that, 
It has to comply with the new branding. You can't, I mean, we put together flyers and I got slapped personally by our district governor, Jerry, what were you thinking when you put together, I thought it was pretty cool. But she goes, yeah, but it's not brand compliant. What does that mean? You'll see the one that I passed around, it has to have the Toastmaster logo and there's a format that it has to, to follow. And now there are templates on TI though that you can download those. And we'll talk about that before we're done. There's a color scheme also. Yeah. yeah it has to be a certain font and it has to comply with these, these, di these different guidelines that Toastmaster International sets down. All right, so you've set your date, you've got your committees together, and I've just got a short list here. So we talk about somebody that's in charge of, of the PR for it that's going to help create the flyer. Whoever you're going to assign that to, that's one of your committee chairs. Your PR chair, somebody's going to handle refreshments, someone's going to handle food. And you want to think about, in terms of food and refreshments, to keep it simple. I'll share, we just did an open house at Mount Prospect too long ago, and it turned out to be a real production. Because our Vice President of Education, she said that she wanted soup, she wanted hot entrees, we wanted vegetable trays, we wanted fruit trays, we wanted various snacks, so we really had a smorgasbord. Now fortunately we meet in a church in Arlington Heights, and we have an adjoining kitchen. A big kitchen. So we were able to stage all the food and then a little bit as we got into the meeting, put it all out, you know, lay it all out real nice on the tables so it was easy for people to kind of go down like a buffet line and not hold everybody up. And we had a probably, at that particular open house, we probably had about 50 or 60 people. To me, it was overkill because there was so much food by the time, I mean, we had, plus we had desserts on top of that. We had ice cream. We had cake. Did you have time to meet? <laughs> After they were grazing, you mean? Yeah, we actually timed it. We were, we were good this way because we had a social. We, we set up a half hour, I'm sorry, 45 minutes before we actually started the formal meeting for people just to network and socialize. So we had actually the food set aside so people could come. They could, you know, kanash on the food and then they could socialize. And then we started the actual meeting at 7 p.m because I'm a community, it's a community club. So they came at, they came at 545, so they had from 545 to 645 to socialize, graze, eat whatever they wanted to, and then we started the meeting at 7 p.m. So when you're doing an open house, I would suggest that too. Allow yourself a little time before you actually start your formal meeting. Yes, Lori? Your formal meeting starts at 7, and you, you backed it up so that people could socialize. Correct. Okay. Right, because otherwise if you started if you started to say 15 minutes before or a half hour before and now everybody's scrambling to go around and get their food and then you got people bringing food in the meetings and so we wanted people to basically come finish eating because when I get to the part of talking about bringing a speaker from the outside so we didn't want that to be a distraction to the meeting because we had a lot of content in our particular open house but just think about the food just to keep it simple you don't have to be real elaborate because it's more about the socializing aspect of it. So you can have, you know, nice food selection without overkill. Does that make sense? And plus, mm -hmm. budget-wise, yeah. I know all of you are operating on, you know, million-dollar budgets as a club. <laughs> so it keeps your, you know, keeps cost containment as far as your, your resources for the club. Yes, and this is interactive. You can ask questions sure. at any time. Now, did you have a full meeting? Or did you abridge the meeting? So you have another question and answer session towards the okay. end. Okay, so we set the meeting up. We had actually, we had promoted and marketed this meeting because Paul was there too. We had actually promoted this meeting about eight weeks in advance. Because as club extension chair, I know a lot of different Toastmasters, so I put, I put it out to everybody that we could possibly think of. Area governors, I had friends of mine were division governors, Lori sits on the deck. So, you know, we, we're putting it out to everybody because you never know how many people you know, you're going to be able to draw to it. But we wanted as many people, thank you, as many people as possible. And so when we started the meeting, we brought in an outside speaker who was Barry Mixon, who's doing the session, Journey to World Champion of Public Speaking. So he was our keynote speaker. So Barry kicked it off. We went through, you know, invocation. We went through pledge, etc., to kick off the meeting. We let everybody know what was going to happen during the meeting. And then I was the Toastmaster, so then I introduced Barry. 
Well, Barry did a 20-minute keynote in this particular meeting. Then after he did his 20-minute keynote, we got right into table topics. And so the people that were there, all the different, you know, both existing Toastmasters and our guests, we had everybody participate. I think we went through eight, eight table topics questions. We kept them, you know, moving along pretty quickly, and we explained that, you know, they're one to two, they're not five to seven. And that kept everybody on track for that, so we got into table topics. And then we took a break. We had, again, about 15 minutes for socializing. And then we started the second half of the meeting. So we got into the evaluation portion of it. So we had, I'm sorry, yeah, second half, second half we had the speakers, so we had one, two, three, four, we had four speakers. Four speakers, four evaluations. Yes, Dan? Yeah, I'm curious to where these 50 people came from who were not, who were not in other clubs. Uh, we had that night, we had uh, eight guests. But it's really helpful if people come from other clubs. Absolutely. So that, for example, my club just had an open house, and mm -hmm. we have about 15 members. And a lot of people from other clubs joined us so that Toastmasters right. is really exciting. Because people are right. talking to their friends, they haven't met them in a while. And the new people who haven't been there before are saying, I could network here, I could give a very short speech, right. I feel like I could improve my life through Toastmasters. And when would they have the opportunity, if they don't venture outside their own home club, when, they, when do they have the opportunity to meet Toastmasters from other clubs? Because the majority of Toastmasters, if some of you aren't aware of this, they never venture outside their club. The majority of Toastmasters never ever get outside their home club. Okay, I can, I can understand that, that's yeah. good. But my, I guess my yeah. mind frame was, adding members to my club. Well, we had a we had a guy who belonged to Arlington Heights Club, to her point. He wound up joining my CrossFit because he liked the dynamic of the club. He liked the energy of the club. Yeah. We had a guy who, uh, mm -hmm. he belonged to uh, Niles. He wound up joining. So now he's a dual member, Niles Club and Mount Prospect. So that happens too, Stan. You know, you want, you want to get more new guests and stuff, but does that person add value to your current membership? Existing Toastmaster or a brand new member. And I love it when an when a existing Toastmaster jumps my prospect because now they add a new dynamic to the mix. When we get a new Toastmaster, of course it's new and fresh. Like Manish, how long are you in Toastmaster now? Year and a half. Okay, a year and a half. So when you get somebody that's less than a year, a little over a year, and you're just still kind of getting your, your feet underneath you and really understanding how the whole program works, you know, that's, that's bringing new ideas and a fresh perspective to your club membership. And that's, when you do the open house, you want to put your best foot forward. You know, you want to put on your A-game face. Because that's the impression you're going to leave with either existing Toastmasters or guests that come into that club. Yes, Jim? Sorry, I think, I'm not Stan is saying, quizzical. Yeah. Well, because we've done a couple of open houses, mm -hmm. and we have a nice turnout because we all show up. <laughs> And you show up and I'm a Toastmaster, but we have difficulty getting the outside to come in. So it's kind of, you know, we talked about setting the goal and, you know, the five weeks out and all of that stuff right. is great, but how do, what's our target market? Who is it that we're really trying to reach and how do we reach them? Because we've been having, I've been in Toastmasters for three years. For three years, we've been having the same conversation. Who's our target market and how do we get to them and get them to the meeting? When, when we decide to do an open house at Mount Prospect, same thing with Peloton. Mm -hmm. We ask each and every member, we call it BYOG. Everybody know what BYOG is? Mm -hmm. Bring your own guest. Yes. We just ask members just bring one guest. Now does that mean that just because we ask, everyone's going to bring one guest? But going back to the acronym I asked, if you never ask your membership, encourage them to invite a guest, they won't bring a guest. And however many guests you wind up with, it's probably more than you ordinarily would, other than unless your website is driving them consistently to your regular club meetings. 
the more that you can promote and market the event, Amy Sagami knows about promotion and marketing because she, she promotes TED. She can tell you, you know, everybody know what TED is? Yeah. TED Talks? So Amy does that in Chicago. If Amy only did that a week or two before, what kind of turnout would you get, Amy? Not much for a week and a half. <laughs> yeah, not much. So it really has to do with the upfront of promoting, promoting and marketing because I understand that corporate is different than, of course, community clubs. You've got different challenges because you're promoting to your internal market, trying to get people from different departments who've never attended the meeting. Or if Lance was talking about that, we could go down a whole list of do you want to focus on something specific for that open house? Impromptu speaking speaking off the cuff, extemporaneous speaking. Do you want to, how to prepare a speech? Do you want to talk about organization? Whatever the theme or subject is, and then have the whole open house revolve around that. Has any, anybody ever done that before? Paul? Yeah, we do remember that open house we did based on uh, the, we focused on the international aspect of Toastmasters okay. International, mm -hmm. and uh, it went over very well. Because when, when, when Barry came to Mount Prospect, part of that was we were right in the midst of the international speech contest. So we were really highlighting and focusing on people that were interested in the contest. Amy's competed in the contest multiple times, so have I. So people that are in that kind of frame of mind, and so people who have never competed before, they're like, hey, I want to go listen to, you know, Barry Mixon. Or I want to go listen to Amy Sagami. She might be able to share some tips and tricks and strategies of how I can improve my speech to, to, to better compete in the contest. So whatever, and then he gave a whole list of holiday themes. I mean, it can be almost anything. It's like, what do you think are going to excite people the most to come to your open house? And I would encourage all of you, is, is, as Sharon just said, is reach out to, first of all, your area governor, invite your division governor, invite district leadership. Because I can tell you, Joan, I've known her for eight years now, or I'm sorry, six years now, Shreena Voss, when he was District Governor Kyle, when I would invite them to come out for events and support it, Joan, from the first one we did to recently, she came out for it. That doesn't mean they're going to stay for the entire event, but you know you can you can promote. Hey, district leadership is coming out for open house. So if it's district governor, lieutenant governor education training, lieutenant governor marketing, division governor is coming out, or you know Lance said this again in his session about somebody in the district who's an excellent speaker that they know you're going to promote them for your open house. I'm willing to, as Sharon and I, you know, been to different clubs together, anytime you can get help, just ask. I want, that's one thing I've really learned in the past five years, you know, just reaching out to different people and say, hey, can you help me with this? As I said in the beginning, not one of us has all the answers. So, you know, it's kind of, let's learn from one another. Best practices, you know, what, you know, if you had an open house, if you did something really different, what did you do that made it so successful? The first time, uh, our, our, um, this is going back, I think, two or three years ago, um, when we did Mount Prospect, we weren't sure what the turnout was going to be. On that one, I invited anybody and everybody, and Barry Mixon was a part of that. A whole bunch of other people were there, and we had standing room only. Again, we had food, we made it fun, we made it interesting, uh, we changed the table topics up, so it wasn't the typical table topics. The last one we did, we actually took uh, because it was based on, Lance was talking about success, our theme was about success in the contest, so we actually had a book which was, uh, uh, some of you, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Simple Truths, and it's Mac Anderson, and he originally was Success Reese, so now he published a website called Simple Truths, and it's all about success, motivation, inspiration, so we actually had table topics revolve around success out of quotes out of this book. Mm. And we had people come up and talk about what does success mean to you? We'd read a quote out of there, it was about success, motivation, inspiration, and then they would, you know, respond to the question with that. And people came up afterwards and they said, you know, that was really a nice idea because it tied together with the theme of our open house. I know Robert's showing me the cards here, so we're, I want to move along here because I want to turn it off to all of you. So you got your open house committee, you got your chairperson, PR person, etc. And the event day, the day of your event. When Lance was talking about, for example, being proactive, it's no different with open house. So you've done all this planning, 
you got the word out in advance, you picked out your committee chairs, you got your food, your refreshments, you've got all those things handled. Now it's the day of your event. You want people showing up early. So your committee chairs, you want to make sure that you're not stressing out, you know, just, oh my God, how are we going to pull this off? You want to have them show up early. Make sure that they've got their food out, make sure they've got their refreshments out. And I learned this just the other day again when I went to Park Ridge. They had a person manning the door. It wasn't their sergeant at arms, but they had a greeter as people came in. Hi, Toby. You know, shaking their hand, giving them, giving them an agenda, thank you for coming. It's like I felt like I was at, you know, Walmart, but on a, <laughs> on a much higher level. But they were just, you know, she, her name was Barbara Javacucci, and she was just so engaging. I'm like, wow, I'm going to get into this meeting. And then she happened to be, you know, speaking uh, later on that evening. And they were, they did it in an open house, but they were also celebrating their 64-year anniversary. Mm -hmm. So if you're celebrating an anniversary for your club, that's a good time to tie in an open house. Because when I went to Stan, when I went to their club, they were celebrating, I believe then, you were celebrating an anniversary. I forget it. That's why we were doing it that time. We were celebrating something. So anytime you've got some sort of event, anniversary, the club that you can tie into your open house, that's a great time to do it as well. Because then, especially if an anniversary, district will definitely turn out for that. So as much district leadership as you can get for an anniversary. Um, so Park Ridge celebrated 64 years, not too long ago. Lake Zurich celebrated 73 years. We celebrated 57 years when we did our last open house, Mount Prospect. It was chartered in 1954, and Park Ridge just chartered, they chartered in 1949. Yes, Amy? When you celebrate the uh, anniversary, is it on the month, or do you celebrate, just pick any time well, during Park, the year? Well, Park Ridge actually, they did, it, they did it to coincide with the date that they meet, so if you meet the first and third, second and fourth, so when they originally chartered, Back in 1949, they chartered in July, July, I'm sorry, June 9th, 1949. Well, the way the dates, thank you, Robert, the way the dates fell, so instead of doing it actually on the 9th of June, because that didn't fall on a Thursday, they did it the second Thursday, which was just this past Thursday. So they wanted to tie it as close together as they could to their actual, you know, charter date back 64 years ago. Jerry? Yes. Right, Jerry. Now I thought is you can have an anniversary party every year. You don't have to wait for 10th right. or 15th. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. And again, it's an opportunity to, because Lance said this in the session, I keep saying going back to Lance, but he said a lot of things that I want to talk about today, is you can always be promoting the club constantly. It's not a, just a one, you know, on and off kind of thing. Because you're always, we're always trying to attract new members to the club, and then an open house just becomes another reason to do it. And please consider collaborating with another club for your open house. An example of that would be, I, you know, Paul was a member of Toastmasters on Purpose and Harper College and also Toastmasters Plus. Three different clubs at Harper College. Toastmasters Plus meets at 7.15 on a Monday morning. Top, which is my advanced club, we meet the second, I'm sorry, the first and third Wednesday. And uh, Harper Toastmasters meets the first and third Thursday. So we all got together, all three clubs, and we had probably about 70 people at the open house. We had, same thing, we had guest speakers come in from the various clubs, you know, each one represented, and they had an opportunity to talk about each one of the respective clubs. We didn't want it just to be one club, because the other thing that's weird about Toastmasters, Let's say Extreme Toastmasters is going to promote the open house. Amy's Club Extreme has to be the primary sponsor of the open house. And then the other two clubs, let's say in this instance, we had to support. So Harper was the primary sponsor of the open house. Tops Toastmasters and Toastmasters Plus was just supporting because that's according to T. So I know it's weird. But really? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. But we had a great time, and it was a but it was collaboration. It was pulling all three clubs together. So if you have a club that's close to where you're at, connect up with them, collaborate with them, because this way you can also draw more people. The more people come to the open house, the better. 
I'm gonna if you'll if you'll give me on the sign up sheet that Lori has she passed around, I will send you a PDF and an Excel spreadsheet that has a complete checklist, open house. I'll send you two different ones. So you can use that. The flyer that I passed around, you can pull that off the Toastmaster International site. There's a lot of information because I pulled this off. There's a lot of information how to host an open house. This is not the Bible because you want to use for your creativity. This is the sheet you're talking about? Yes. Uh -huh. We want to receive. Yes. Yeah, and I'll make sure that each and every one of you get the information. So I'll send you the links to it. But this is a good primer for it, how to host an open house. And those of you, of course, now we're going into a new Toastmaster year, you have an area governor. Lori was an excellent area governor. And so you want to tap into your area governor, too. They're a resource for you. Each and every one of us in this room is a resource for one another. That's really where our strength lies as Toastmasters. Toby, I'd reach out to Toby. If I'm coming up to Wisconsin, Toby, how can I help you? Toby came down via Ethel's invitation, because Ethel's also a member of District 35 up in Wisconsin. He drove down from Wisconsin to help us today. That's a true spirit of a Toastmaster. So if we will just reach out to one another, open houses, anything that we do related to Toastmasters, because you know, just like we tell members, you know, one member doesn't make a club. Each of us need all of us, and it takes all of us for each of us to be successful. And that's how you can have a really successful open house is by drawing upon all these resources. Amy put on an event last year. It wasn't an open, well, it, a was, theme. it was a theme, right. And you want to tell them quick, quickly what that was? It was a let's see, extreme contest. We did a speech contest in the American Idol style, uh -huh. and Jerry was one of the speakers, uh, with the, along with a couple other ones, and the evaluators. These are all champions. There's a lot of resources you can draw on, and so we had close to 90 people showed up. We got a lot of uh, membership sign up as well as the publicity. One thing I like to add to it is when you do an event like this, let your member know this is a fabulous opportunity for them to invite all their friends to come to a party. And right. for people in the MLM networking, in you know, all their business, it's an opportunity for them to invite their colleagues to come. Yeah. I say invite anyone and everything, your coworkers, your friends, your family, your enemies, people you, <laughs> you worship with, anyone that, because Lance said this earlier this morning, but all of us are Toastmasters, why wouldn't you want to share that with people? It seems so, you know, it's like, really? Because we ask that question a lot. You know, why, don't, why aren't people members of Toastmasters? I mean, we know from a, you know, not even a cost standpoint, an investment standpoint, for the value that it returns to all of us, there's nothing else out there that can even remotely compare to that. But you have to understand, too, why don't people join us? Because the biggest number one fear is getting up and speaking in public. And that, Okay, let's, let me, let's, let's, let's address that. Let's address <laughs> that. I'm glad you brought that up, Stan, because in Toastmasters sometimes, Toastmasters becomes formulaic in a lot of things. And just like TI and their infinite wisdom, as, as even Deepmar would say that, Lance has said that multiple times, in Toastmasters a lot of times we'll make these statements. For example, we'll, we'll come to what Stan just said, practice makes perfect. Who believes really that practice makes perfect? The right practice. Yes. Perfect practice perfect. makes perfect. Okay. You really believe that? Perfect practice makes perfect. It works in sports. I don't know about speaking. Perfect. What, is, what is perfect practice? Practice makes permanent. And it makes progress and it makes improvement. It doesn't make perfect. Because even, you talk about sports. Uh, I was just having a conversation at lunchtime with someone, like, okay, Maybe we won't use we won't use Tiger Woods. We we'll use Phil Mickelson. How many golf balls do you think he gets out on the range and hits? Five thousand, six thousand. He has a coach. The best of the best have a coach. You know, and they're at the elite level. Michael Phelps. I was just telling someone this at lunchtime. Michael Phelps, seven seven medals. Right, seven nine. 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 I'm sorry, nine. Okay, so nine. <laughs> nine medals. Michael Phelps now wants to take his game of golf to a high level. He has hired one of the best golf coaches in the world to coach him how to up his game in golf. He's a world-class champion. 
and yet he wants to elevate his game of golf to that level. So he hired the best coach for golf. Yes, Paul? I can say something. In sports, it doesn't work because I am an example of having so little ability in sports that no matter how much I practice, I still can't do it. There's got to be a, a bit of ability to, to grow on and practice. Absolutely. Right. Also. Yeah. Huh? Coaching, the analyst. <laughs> because Lance Miller, why does Lance continue to go to Toastmasters? He needs to learn. You go, you grow. You got a yearning for learning, right? There's always a little bit more that we can, I can learn from Stan, I can learn from each one of you. And uh, Nino Cuevan, anybody know who Nino Cuevan is? You know who he is? Yeah. yeah. And, and he, has a, he has a saying, he says, nobody's ever perfect, but everyone can improve. And especially from a speaking standpoint, communication standpoint, leadership standpoint, you know, we all have a passion for learning, for leadership, for communication, etc. But if we thought we were so presumptuous, what? We're perfect. This is the best we can do. It's like telling a new member, how many speeches have you given? Have you got your CC yet? No. Okay. So he's working on his competent communication man. So he says, okay, I've completed my CC. I'm as good as I can get. Or we learn in Toastmasters, you know, it's like you create a different speech for each one of the projects. So you've got 10 speeches. I call it the 10-step program. So you've created a speech for each one of those projects. If you never give that same speech again, are you going to improve that speech? You give me feedback. I'm like, that's great. But I never apply it to the project that I just did. It may not be applicable to the next project because what you evaluate with me on the icebreaker is going to be different than what you evaluate with me on, you know, persuade or visual aids or body language, etc. Yes, Lord? No, I'm just time, I'm giving you your Okay, time's up thing? Okay. Almost. So getting back to what Stan said. Public speaking is not the number one fear. If you look at the book of lists, we tout that because it's a good kind of you know tagline. Public speaking, you know, people have the fear, number one, and all that. It's actually number three on the current list. Fear of flying is number one. Yeah, and it took out speaking. Pardon me? Time. Flying took speaking off the top. Oh, I thought that was one. Actually, it's number four or five. Death is like number four or five down on the list because the, the, the cliche, again, is always, you hear that a lot, Jerry Seinfeld, everybody know that quote where he's saying, most people fear, you know, speaking more than they do death. Yeah. You're the one that would rather be in the casket than be mm -hmm. the one giving a eulogy. So we say some of these things sometimes, oh. and, and <laughs> we, we almost, we perpetuate that. We, as Toastmasters. Yeah. Not everybody comes to Toastmasters. Some people come to Toastmasters, Lance was talking about this earlier. Not everybody comes at the Toastmasters on a level playing field. Amy Sagami, she speaks all over the world. Now, initially, her why may have been to get more comfortable, you know, overcome that nervousness, the anxiety, the jitters. Lance talks, <laughs> Lance talks about his kneecaps, you know, bouncing up and down when he first started. But we all come for different reasons. Yes, Amy? May I speak since I'm here? Yes. <laughs> my why to come to Toastmasters is that I can practice my material in front of the live audience instead of the couch. And that was my why, because then I could get feedback and see what works, what people are thinking, and I can hone that speech. Thank you. And, and that's, and when she, the why, that connects everything. Think about each and every one of us. Think back to why you joined Toastmasters. Now, how can we create that same kind of environment, that same kind of experience when we have an open house? have that same energy, that same enthusiasm, that same excitement that you felt when you became part of Toastmasters. So what would you want that experience to be for your guest, for the people coming to that open house? If you just make it kind of monotone and boring and blasé and there's no excitement and you don't exude that energy, what do you think your guest and other members from even other clubs are going to think, oh wow, I'm glad I came to this, right? So you connect back to that one. Paul and, and Tim Bolger, a lot of times they don't get the credit they deserve because they've given so much to Toastmasters. 
they come out to God knows how many different open houses to record it. I've invited Paul, say, Paul, he brings his daughter, Caitlin, out to it. She loves it. But that's just reaching out to another fellow Toastmaster to be part of it. That's the beauty of it. I had an opportunity to come to Stan's club. I've been to Sharon's club. I've been to Lori's club. She's been to mine. And doing that really adds more impact and power to it. It really does. And, and if I can leave you with one, one thing really to remember is each one of us are a resource for one another. And email me. I will re I'm real good about responding back to people. I won't say, yeah, 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 I'll get back to you and then you don't want to hear from me for two, three, three months from now. And then if I don't have the answer, if, you know, I can't reach out to someone that can help you in your club, then I'll reach out to someone else in the district that can. I'll reach out to Lori or, you know, Lori, by the way, Lori and her husband talk about, you know, Father, son joining Toastmasters and mother, daughter, Lori and her husband Robert, some of you probably don't know him, they became double DTMs. They got their DTMs at the same time, just recently. So how cool is that? And town criers, Lori told me she belongs to town criers. And I first met Lori back in uh, 2010. Where's the love? When we did a speech at them. Up in Vernon Hills. That's the first time yes. I met that the first time that I met Lori. So I stayed connected with her and you know, so again we, we kind of invite each other things. Yes, Paul. Talking about why's of joining Toastmasters, that's something you can do with a guest. If you can find out from your guest why they might want to join Toastmasters, you can push that part of it to them. Now in my in my case, public speaking and leadership training had nothing to do with why I joined Toastmasters. Hmm. At that point, I, I had just started a business of my own. Everything was, everything, all the people around me were very negative. So I really appreciated the positiveness of Toastmasters. And also, it was something I can get out and do once in a while. Have any of you ever gone to a Toastmaster meeting and left it feeling depressed or down? No. <laughs> it doesn't matter what kind of mood you're in prior to going to the meeting. You can have the worst day ever and then go in and then especially if you have a joke master in your club or humorous, you know, somebody shares a light story, or you hear a speech or even table topics question, just make you crack up. You know, just say, Wow, that's really something. You know, here's somebody's personal story and a fun table topics question. All of a sudden, you know, you make that shift. So you feel better, you feel uplifted, you know, leaving it than you did before you came into the meeting. The last thing I want to, and then I know Lori's going to close this up, is uh, make sure that all of you have name tags and make sure you supply name tags for your guests. So then I'm going to say, what's, what's your name? <laughs> and you kind of have to play that guessing game so that you, know, you can speak one-on-one -on -one and acknowledge that person so you can be totally present for that. But I will email all of you, send me your email address, I'll email you this information. Reach out to me and Thank you for coming this afternoon. Lori, I'm sure, is going to tell you about the evaluation forms to make sure that you complete those. If I did a horrible job, please don't put that down there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's thank Jerry for his presentation. And I want to give a special thank you to Toby. I hope Toby will come back because 35, I've been to District 35, it's also a great district. And Ethel, God bless her, I mean, she, she really is the energizer bunny. Um, she wanted to really do this session this afternoon. But as I said, you know, family matter took her away from it. Um, she's going to be a terrific LGM for us because her enthusiasm and her energy. And she just, well, she did a recognition, she kind of did it as a recognition event for the North Division. And we got to dance at the, right. at the event because she had Ruben, who's out there, uh, who was the DJ, and he also has a band. So we had a dance contest, and we had Robert Kleiner, who was also a stand-up comedian. So you can even bring, a, you know, Robert Kleiner would love to come to some of your clubs and give him, you know, eight or ten minutes on the agenda. And he does stand-up comedy, and he's an excellent toaster. So yeah, you have all those opportunities available to you. So did everybody, yeah, did everybody? Make sure you wrap up, do your evaluations for yeah. Jerry. I want to thank 
We thank Toby, I want to thank yes. Robert, and I want to thank Paul for their participation in this meeting as well. Thank you all for thank coming. You.